All right, friends, you are in for a treat today. My guest, his name is Brent Bishore, and he is the CEO and founder of Permanent Equity. He's also been dubbed, although I think he would decline this title, the next Warren Buffett. In fact, Brent, I think you would take this as a compliment. In an interview, I heard somebody call you Baby Buffett. Now, <laughs> we will get into that. I see you cringing, but in some ways, it's a compliment of just the success you've had in the business world. And we're going to talk a little bit about what you do in business, how it informs your faith, but also you have a journey that I came across of being an atheist and becoming a Christian that we're going to unpack as well. But first, I just want to say thanks for coming on because I know you carefully invest your money, but also your time. So thanks from the viewers and myself for being with us today. Yeah, thanks, Sean, for having me on. I appreciate it. Well, let's jump into your business. I'm intrigued by it. What is Permanent Equity? Yeah, permanent Equity is a, we're a private equity firm. Um, we're just a very unusual form of private equity. Um, and, and my faith actually has influenced quite a bit of, of what Permanent Equity has become. And, and you know, I would call it a, a, a more redemptive form of private equity. Hmm. So normally private equity, to kind of frame it up for maybe people who aren't familiar, um, buys a company, uses a lot of debt in the transaction to, to be able to finance it. Um, debt always helps increase equity returns if things go well. Hmm. Um, it also adds instability, uh, adds risk to the, to, the, to the transaction. And the idea is to, uh, to buy a company, you, you lever it up, you use a lot of debt, you try to um, improve it somehow, um, mostly on the financial metrics, and then you try to quickly sell it to somebody else and, and, and harvest that gain. So um, we do almost the exact opposite of that. Um, you know, hopefully we generate gains too for our investors. We want to be excellent at, at the work we do. Um, but it's about far more than that. So we buy with no intention of selling the business. Uh, we typically use no debt in our transactions. Okay. And we like to, to partner with people uh, for a long time. We're trying to take a, a, a slow mm -hmm. and steady approach, uh, trying to treat people as, as people made in the image of God and um, trying to treat them as humans. And it's hmm. not all about you know, efficiency and how, how ruthless we can be and eliminating cost structures. It's, it's, a, it's a lot about trying to look at all the stakeholders, you know, not just the seller and not just the buyer, um, but also the employees and the leadership teams and the vendors and the, um, the customers and the communities that they're in, uh, maybe even the regulators or maybe even the, hmm. the industry uh, that, that they're in and say, okay, what would it look like for a win for all of those stakeholders hmm. uh, over a long period of time? Because ultimately, if any of those stakeholders are, are, are getting a raw end of the deal, it's not sustainable. The only thing that's hmm. sustainable is a win for everyone. So okay. um, we want to, we want to, you know, treat people well over long periods of time, treat people with kindness and respect. And, and certainly we want to do well financially. Um, but we think that, that doing well financially is a lot more about um, winning together and growing the, the, the pie, if you want to think about that way, as opposed to, you know, cleverly slicing it better. Hmm. It, it's obvious from, from reading a little bit about permanent equity that your faith influences the way you do business. And we're going to come back and unpack that a little bit. But just a couple questions about business that intrigued me is I'm on your website. I'm thinking, okay, they've invested in a company that built pools in Arizona, aerospace parts, and a personal matchmaking service. How do you and your team possibly know enough about these different industries to have success in those different realms? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, what I would say is unlike the, the public markets or even much larger companies that, that there's a lot of complexity to the, to the business model, right? I mean, if you ask me, what does General Electric do? I could tell you some of the things that they do, but but I couldn't tell you a lot. I certainly couldn't tell you how hmm. they finance it. I couldn't tell you all the customer dynamics, maybe the power dynamics, uh, where the relationships are, um, you know, who, who has the skill sets, how difficult that skill set is to acquire, any of those things. In a lot of the companies that, that are smaller, so yeah, we're we're across manufacturing, construction, aerospace, matchmaking, military recruitment. Uh, um, it, it's kind of across the board. There are very straightforward businesses, though. Um, they're, they're they're smaller, they're more simplistic, and to understand that, now that but simple doesn't mean easy. It's it's brutally difficult. Sure. Um, you know, I, I joke that all businesses are loosely functioning disasters that happen to make money. <laughs> Uh, if they do. Um, and uh, it actually is amazing that anybody can make money uh, in business, uh, seeing all the obstacles, and how difficult it is, right? Mm. Uh, I mean, it is, 
it is a combination of, you know, eating glass and trying not to get stabbed, right? And wow. Trying to get back in bed at the end of the day. Wow. Um, everything, it's kind of like uh, going on a walk in Africa, right? Everything wants to kill you. Um, mm. So, um, you know, we uh, look like uh, we try to be thoughtful and try to ask a lot of good questions, try to have high humility about what we don't know. And, and what we tell every seller or leadership team in the companies that we partner with is you all are the experts, we're not. Uh, our expertise lies in the style of company and the size of company that we work with. Okay. We, we like to work with what we think of as adolescent companies where they're too big to be small, hmm. but too small to be big. Okay. Um, and they're all facing the same challenges. Um, now, maybe a little bit different flavors and different situations. You know, every situation is unique, but uh, for the most part, there's a everything tastes like chicker layer of business, right? Where hmm. it doesn't matter if you're doing matchmaking or building pools or building picture frames or whatever it might be. Hmm. Um, you know, it, people are, you, you still got to find customers. You still got to understand how technology is going to come into play. You want to have clean, actionable information that's turned into uh, turned into to, to strategy, um, you know, you want to have all the same infrastructure. So um, look, we've never met a company that's doing all those things well. Um, and we like to, to say, though, that we're going to take a slow approach. It's not a um, mm. it's not a matter of uh, how quickly can we change things. Uh, we want to partner with these businesses for 10, 20, 30 years. And so, wow. Um, wow. you know, it, it's, a, it's a lot different approach. So I know my audience is going to be just fascinated by your journey from becoming a Christian to from being an atheist. But just one last business question for you. What's your sense of how the economy is doing? Are you cautious? Are you optimistic? Is it a mix? Just give us novices a sense of how you analyze the economy and even the future of businesses. Yeah, well, so we're in a, I mean, I hate to say it, an unprecedented time. I guess every time is unprecedented in some ways. Um, but in terms of how, quote unquote, normal the business world is right now, I mean, we have chosen as a society to increase the the, the monetary supply dramatically over the past uh, couple of years. Um, so there means there's, there's more out there chasing the same assets, which typically you'll see mm. an inflationary pressure. And so we're certainly seeing inflation uh, in the economy. I mean, we have the, the highest inflation in 40 years at a minimum, probably more wow. like 60 years. Um, and we're seeing in the business world sort of the, the input cost for a business, you know, raw materials, um, certain types of labor costs. Um, you know, the two hallmarks right now are, are inflation and scarcity. It's been a long time. I mean, this is my first time um, based on my age. I'm 38 years old, almost 39. I've never been through a period of time like this. The early 80s were, were kind of hmm. the, the most recent time. And so I've actually been, you know, trying to be humble and trying to go back and ask people who were uh, investing hmm. and operating businesses back then, you know, what it was like. And, you know, a lot of our uh, intuition uh, about how to make decisions is it feels off right now. Um, and look, in all of our businesses, I would say that that we have tried to be on the forefront of being thoughtful around, you know, inflation and scarcity as being two things and trying to, you know, overstock items and trying to be make sure we're in we're in stock with supply and, and we've run out in, in almost all mm. of our businesses uh, at various times wow. and inflation even as much as we thought we were ahead of it is caught us by surprise even i mean we're seeing i guess in this last month uh consumer prices were up two percent uh, month over month from, from wow. a yearly basis which means i mean annualized out i mean it's over 20 percent inflation now i don't think we're quite there yet um, i think that may have been a little bit of a blip but um, it certainly is is real, and I think that we're going to see um, hopefully government policy that, that sort of helps correct some of that because they cause some of that too. I mean, not to get political about it, I think it's an apolitical issue for the most part, but um, it certainly is uh, it certainly is a challenge. Hmm. I really appreciate that insight, and I have so many more business questions for you, but I think my audience in particular would love to hear your story. You describe yourself as a former atheist who became a Christian. What was that journey like? Yeah, I was born skeptical. Uh, I don't know how else to say it. I mean, I feel like there, <laughs> there are certain people that, um, that, that I admire. I used to not admire them, but I, I, I admire them greatly that just have a, an ability as a gift to believe um, and to see mm. the truth for what it is. I mean, you know, um, I, I just didn't come with that. I, I, I popped out uh, arrogant and condescending and prideful mm. and... Um, that I needed to, to um, gain from this world and selfish ambition came pretty naturally to me. And um, 
you know, from a young age, I mean, I, uh, I really enjoyed beating people in Monopoly and, uh, I, I, I enjoyed, uh, people's praise and, um, it was, it was, uh, you know, it's, it's been a challenge for me. And so I, um, let's see, I can remember, I, I told my mom, I didn't believe in God when I was, I think I was nine years old. I, I wow. remember we were driving. <clears throat> yeah. My brother was in the back seat. I can remember we were in Joplin, Missouri and we were driving by Carl Richards wow. bowling alley. And, uh, I, I, I can't remember how it came up, but I said, mom, I don't, I don't believe in God. And my mom said, well, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to think on that more and you have to, you know, work through it. She was gracious about it. My brother was, uh, six years old. He starts crying in the back seat. Um, oh my goodness. And, uh, you know, it's just one of those things. It was just an interesting, uh, to, you know, you have these, you have these markers in your life. So, so you kind of take that. And then mm. I just went on kind of a, a, a struggle, you know, I would say it's, a, it's a, been a journey. Um, you know, I, um, I have always enjoyed reading and thinking, um, and uh, certainly uh, God gave me an analytical mind uh, in some ways. And so, um, you know, I read a lot uh, through high school and college, uh, read a lot about other religions, read a lot about mm. um, new atheism, and that that was sort of, you know, kind of on the, on the up and up yeah. on the rise back then. And, um, I, you know, I would say I ended up in my... Um, mid twenties as a really ardent condescending atheist. Um, mm. you know, I would say I was a strict materialist. I thought this world was all there was. Wow. And, um, I, you know, as much Nietzsche as I read and as much, uh, you know, philosophy as I studied, I just really had never challenged the tenets of my atheism. Um, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't, you know, if you asked me, you know, what is, is there right and wrong? Is there morality? I would say, well, of course, course i know what morality is you know everyone has morality. well where does that come from i couldn't tell you i mean i would have maybe maybe argued something from evolutionary biology um but i wouldn't have certainly had a a rooting to it and um i wouldn't have been able to articulate uh that there was a sort of ultimate right and wrong in, in a cohesive way and so i lived with a with an incoherence i mean i i was um I, i'd wake up every day uh trying to prove that i was worth something trying to trying wow. to matter uh, and I would feel like I didn't matter. And I thought that, you know, for a long time, if I was in uh, the business world and I did something meaningful in the business world, that I would matter. And I would matter to myself. I would matter to the people around me. I'd matter to the world. And, you know, um, looking back on it, by God's grace, I, you know, I had experienced some success. And in my late 20s, you know, I was making more money than I ever thought I'd make. And uh, I had a beautiful wife who loved me. And uh, I felt dead inside. I felt like I didn't... Um, uh, I feel, I feel like it was just, this is it. You know, I, I don't know some of the Jim Carrey quotes that he's talked about. I don't know if you've seen some of his interviews, but yeah. he's uh, incredibly articulate and, um, you know, uh, sort of honest about his nihilism. And I, I, I relate so mm. much to that. I can remember telling my wife that, uh, I didn't love her, that I don't think I loved anybody. Um, wow. I can tell, I can remember, um, you know, really not caring about anybody, um, and not even caring about myself. I mean, I just kind of felt, mm. felt dead. Mm. And it was really interesting because around that time, um, I started meeting people who loved and served and didn't care about uh, their reputations in all the best ways and just, just went out there and cared for people. And I was like, who are these people? You know, what are they, what's going on? And then, and then I found out they were Christians and I was like, oh, you got to be kidding me. Come on. Like th those people, you know, like those idiots. Um, and um, I just noticed there was something remarkably different about the way they lived their lives. And um, so I got to be friends with them. And they weren't, by the way, trying to convert me. They weren't, you know, they weren't trying to be friends with me so that I'd become a Christian. It was just a, it was a, uh, they wanted a relationship. And, um, you know, uh, they started also giving me books and taking me to lunch and having arguments with me. And of course, I thought I was the smartest guy in the room and that I could, you know, out argue them. And, uh, pretty quickly, I realized I didn't know as, as much as I thought I did, and uh, um, I didn't really have good answers, and, and they did. They had a lot better, just more thoughtful, logical answers. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, it was interesting. It's I don't think anybody has ever argued into faith, um, and, and you know, in terms of you know, apologetics as a field, I, I love the thoughtful study of, of right theology, right? I think it's a, I think, you know, right theology is knowing who God really is and who we really are, what reality is, right? That's what, that's what apologetics is about. But the field of apologetics in terms of trying to like bludgeon people into giving up their <laughs> atheism, um, I think is, is a, is a futile task. I mean, at the I end agree. of the day, if, you know, if you're reformed, you believe that it's by God's grace alone, but it's not like I'm smart and therefore found uh, Jesus. It was Jesus came down and found me and um, 
you know, transform my heart, transform my life, transform my marriage, transform my relationships. Um, and, um, you know, ultimately, uh, led to me surrendering and trusting in and relying upon, um, mm. his, his finished saving work. And, and, uh, it's been a, just a beautiful transformation. I mean, it's still very much incomplete. If you talk to my wife or my kids or my coworkers, um, but, uh, but it's certainly the, the feeling that I have, you know, I would say I'd go every day from being sweaty, palmed, anxious, uh, you know, feeling existential dread to, wow. you know, I still have moments of anxiety, um, sure. but, but I honestly, most days feel peaceful and just grateful. Mm. So, so looking back kind of at that season, you said they gave you books and you thought their arguments were better. What are maybe one or two of the just arguments or facts that kind of got your attention that maybe put chinks in your armor, so to speak, <laughs> that made you see things differently? Yeah, the pebble in the shoe, right? There um, you go. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think definitely um, the fine tuning of the universe was certainly one. Um, you know, I, I think the fine tuning argument, even by new atheists, would would argue, and there's some great quotes uh, on this topic from from you know. Um, the new atheists uh, in particular about fine tuning is the most difficult thing, I think, for atheism. If you mm -hmm. look like the the odds that we would be uh, in the environment that we are held together by the, you know, the bonds and our electrons and and protons and the, the way, you know, sort of the, the subatomic particles are held together and the, the, the fine tuning that would be needed to um, have life be uh, even available, right um the, even the possibility for life is is like infinitesimally small it'd be like you know i think somebody uh made the analogy it'd be like playing a game of poker and getting four aces like 17 or eighteen thousand times in a row right Some, something like there's no possible way that that would be by accident no one would play you know 17 straight thousand straight hands of poker and say oh yeah i got four aces every time i'm just you know that's just how the game goes right um you would say clearly that the, the the deck has been monkeyed with right um clearly that, that things have been planned out and so I think that was certainly an, an, an argument um, that that when I really dug into it, I thought that you know the quote unquote science, and I don't see any conflict by the way between science and and uh, mm. and, and faith at all. And in fact, I mean Francis Collins, who, who leads the NIH right now, is a devout believer, and 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 credits science. If actually you read his background, credits science with bringing him to faith. Yeah. And uh, my wife's a PhD in molecular microbiology, and she credits uh, science with with really being a bolstering to her faith. Um, wow. And so um, anyway, uh, you know, I would say fine tuning is certainly certainly one argument. And then just like the the basis for morality, um, mm -hmm. you know, I there, you know, the only thing that that comes close that you can maybe argue is social contract theory. Um, that, you know, we agree that there's a common set of things that we think are right and wrong. And so we have a social contract that, that brings us together and we say, you know, we're going to, we're going to sort of have common, common ground, but that doesn't ultimately make something right or wrong. Um, I mean, I think there is real evil in this world and I think people see it. And I certainly as an atheist would have, would have said, you know, uh, murder is wrong. Rape is wrong. Um, you know, uh, screwing somebody over for gain, um, mm. is wrong. Like, like I think, and, and we have such a, you know, all of us have such a, a finely tuned sense of justice, right. Um, that where does that come from? I mean, literally if we are, um, just, you know, biological accidents, um, if you look at nature, um, I mean, uh, Annie Dillard, right. Has a, has a great book that she wrote in the, I think it was the late seventies. Right. And she said, you know, the nature is red and tooth and claw. Um, you know, it's, there's, there's no, there's no justice in the, in the animal kingdom. There's no justice in nature. It is, it is a pure power play. It is, uh, eat or be eaten. And, um, I think that we as humans know that that's not right, but what, what measuring stick do we have to say something is right or wrong? Where did, where did human rights come from? Mm. Um, and as an atheist, I, I couldn't tell you. I mean, I could tell you that, well, we all just feel them. And so they're there, but, you know, Christianity would say it's, well, of course they're there because we're made in the image of God and because God has imprinted on all of our hearts, um, you know, a, a right and a wrong. Um, but really I wouldn't even, I, so much of, of what I would say as an atheist, uh, I was using a Christian measuring stick, uh, for my atheism. Um, and so I would say those are, you know, those are two, I mean, I, you know, certainly the, the presence of of beauty, um, you know, what is, what is meaning, uh, you know, where does meaning come from? Like, what are we trying to, why do we want to even matter? Mm -hmm. Well, who cares? Right. Why do we all have such a desire to matter? Um, so. 
So that's a great answer. I've heard uh, Christopher Hitchens mention fine tuning as being what he would consider the strongest argument if, if he were to be convinced. But even the fine tuning argument tells us there's a mind behind the universe that is powerful and that is smart and that is purposeful. The moral argument at best would tell us this is a moral universe and there's a moral lawgiver. But both Jews and Muslims and other monotheists would agree with those two arguments. So this brings you even beauty and meaning brings you to a theistic universe. But what was it that brought you to Jesus? Was it just encountering him in the Gospels? Was it the evidence for the resurrection or something else? What made you say in this meaningful moral universe, I want to be a Christian in particular? Yeah, it's interesting because I studied um, lots of religions in college, and actually, um, you know, I, my, my personal belief is there's there's incredible truth that runs through, you know, all of, all religions. Um, hmm. I, I don't think all religions lead to the same place, and I think that anybody who would say so is minimizing the differences between uh, religions. But but I would say is there's there's incredible truth in in um, Islam. There's incredible truth in Buddhism and Hinduism, and uh, and 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 look, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of wisdom in in common grace, right? And in, in just even without religion that you would call it. I mean, I think that I would very much say that I follow the David Foster Wallace, like everyone worships, right? So you only get a question what to worship. Um, and uh, uh, you know, for me, the the person of Jesus was it's just momentous. Like I mm. uh, I I think I uh, growing up I had a, such a small step stool view of Jesus, right? He was like this little helper that uh you know you called on and and no one really uh, i didn't see at least in the lives of people who would say they were christians that there was a centrality wow. to jesus i would say it was like you know they were they were religious they were doing they were doing good because they were good people and that's you know that's where, where good people went is do you go to church right and i just that never was attractive to me like religion has always been um very distasteful to me um and so um but when i first started studying jesus seriously um i mean it's a, clearly the most important person that's ever lived he split time um even other religions islam would say he's a prophet right mm. um and uh and and there's really this kind of this venn diagram there's been a lot of people who've changed the world right so you'd say you know um gandhi or buddha um you know they would say i mean they're not god i mean both of them you know, would, would of course say they're not God. Um, there's been a lot of people who changed the world. There's been there's been people who have said they were God um, and then have been quickly forgotten, right? Um, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and and if you look at the person of Jesus, like he's the only person who's claimed to be God and has changed the world. And 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 there's literally just one person in that Venn diagram. Um, and um, you know, you, you have to go back to the uh, C.S. Lewis. Uh, you know, he's either a, a, a madman. Uh, okay. or, or, you know, schizophrenic, or, or you have to say he's Lord, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I think that, that, you know, we study, you know, going back to, you know, who I was as an atheist, I, I studied all kinds of biographies, right? I wanted to know who the smartest people were, and how did they get their power, and how did they get their intelligence, and what, what wisdom did they have? And if you if you look at those people who I was studying, they all studied Jesus, um, but for some reason I didn't want to study Jesus. Right? Um, here's this person who 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 I mean, gosh, he he was the poorest of the poor. He was from a backwater, backwoods uh, part of the world. Um, he was dirt poor. Uh, he he taught for three years, uh, died a terrible death, and yeah. changed the world forever. Like, how in the world? Like. I, how did that happen? Wouldn't, you know, and, and I would, you know, and now it seems so obvious that you would study Jesus because I mean, at the very least, even if you don't think he's who he says he is, like you should at least study, how did he, Agreed. how did he change the world? Um, and so, yeah, I would just say, you know, why did I become a Christian? I think it was, a, it was uh, the study of, of who Jesus was and, and then a mm -hmm. personal encounter. I mean, I think that it's just, you know, unmistakable, um, you know, at some point, I mean, it was it was definitely a gradual process, but at some point, it just became such a real uh, thing, and and I I believed who he said he was, and that he was truthful, and I think the resurrection, certainly studying the resurrection and the the historicity of it, um, uh, was a major part of that. But but ultimately, um, you know, as a sort of reformed believer, I I it, God ultimately called me and and converted me i mean i think that it wasn't from my effort it wasn't from how <clears throat> smart i am or what i studied it was it was uh it was a gift and and what a great gift it is 
So I'm curious what you would say to your younger non-Christian self or just to somebody who's a business person who's had success, like all the things that the world we live in seems to often say will bring happiness. You found yourself in a very different spot in your mid-20s. So what would you say to your younger pre-Christian self or another business person who's maybe open to the Christian faith but not there? Well, I would say... um... Is what you're doing working for you? I mean, are you are you happy? Are you um, are you satisfied with life? Are you um, have you arrived? And do you feel like that that you're pleased with with where things are? I mean, I certainly, if you'd asked me that question, and I was being honest, I, I don't know if I could have been honest, but if I was being mm-hmm. honest in my mid to late twenties, um, I would have said no. I would have said I'm miserable. Um, I, I would have I would have said this all seems like what what a what a cruel joke that we're put on this earth for a short time. And, wow. you know, I mean, and, and that's with having, you know, all the material comforts, um, and, and, and a lot of control and, you know, a, a reasonable position in society and, and the, you know, awards and the praise of men and all those things. Um, you know, I'd also say is, uh, do, do you find yourself bumping up against reality often? <laughs> like, hmm. like the, do, do things work the way you expect them to work? Because um, if not, maybe you should have a humility about you. Uh, maybe you should uh, realize that the world is a lot more complicated and, and large than, than you. And, and maybe you should realize that you're not the uh, pivot point of reality, that, uh, right. you know, that, that you are uh, but a vapor, right? And, uh, and that that should be actually an encouraging thing to you. Um, that, 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 that is, that means that you don't have control and that's a good thing. Um, and maybe let that point you to where ultimate control lies and, and, uh, maybe to release some of the, uh, tight fisted white knuckled control you're trying to exert over life and that you should let life, uh, uh, happen to you more than trying to control everything. So reading articles you've written in Forbes and your website, listening to some interviews, it's clear to me that you have very thoughtful criteria and a strategy for choosing businesses to invest in. What is just for us novices, some of those criteria? And then as a follow-up, do you apply that criteria or would you suggest that other people apply similar criteria to how they think about faith? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't know how thoughtful we really are. I mean, I think that ultimately there are really smart investors and I, I wouldn't put us even I mean, technically we invest capital. Um, that's how that's the mechanism in which we we, we use to, to be in business. But but uh, we consider ourselves more operators than investors. Uh, we think that hmm. uh, the, the investing side of what we do is actually pretty straightforward. I mean, we're doing math on the you know, not literally the back of the napkin, but but similar. Um, and uh, if, if, if the math doesn't work out on the back of the napkin, it's not going to get better in the spreadsheet. Uh, and so, um, you know, we try to keep things pretty simple. I mean, ultimately, what we're looking for in businesses is, um, you know, a, a, an industry that we think uh, has some sort of uh, protection and niche that they that this you know, company occupies. Um, you know, technically the term would be, a you know, producing above returns, uh, above average returns on invested capital so that you can take capital or increasing amounts of capital and, 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 and use it to uh, increase the returns of the business uh, on an above average sort of uh, return profile. Um, you know, for kind of layman's terms, it's just having a business that, that is valued, like that, that matters and that, that is good at what they do. Um, you know, beyond that, it's about the people. Um, I mean, look, businesses are mm. nothing more than collections of people, um, and mm. people are messy and difficult, and me included, you, all of us. Um, and so, you know, how those people interact, what what are the the common rules that they've agreed on as a as a group? That's that's called culture. Um, you know, what is that culture? And and then, do we think that um, that that has overlap with how we view the world, and that we would like to engage with those people for a very long period of time? Um, I mean, I hate to to boil it down to too too overly simplistic, but that really is it. I mean, the the, the math takes care of itself. Uh, the score takes care of itself if if you get the if you get the business and the people right. And um, okay. you know, we have a mixed record of doing that. I mean, I think that you know we've made plenty of mistakes, and um, I, I think that you know, I'm not I've not talked to anybody who's been in business for very long that hasn't made a lot of mistakes. And so I think that's just <laughs> part of the that's part of the game. There there actually sure. is like a you know, uh, there's real wisdom that you gain over time and, and, and you, you rarely gain wisdom from, uh, from success. Uh, uh, you gain a lot more typically from, from failure, although 
definitely not aiming for failure. <laughs> we'd like to, we'd sure, like to, uh, sure. I pray to God all the time that, uh, you know, it's like, I, I'd like to, I'd like to have wisdom, but I'd like to have it gently, please. So, you know. <laughs> so does that, does that apply in any way, the way you approach a business to the way that you would suggest or do approach faith or are they separate? Yeah. I mean, I would say, um, the, the, the faith certainly impacts the business more than the business impacts faith. I mean, I've seen God at work in our okay. business for sure. And it, it definitely is a reinforcing loop. Um, and I feel, feel incredibly blessed at the gifts that God's given. I mean, all of this is a gift. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I haven't earned any of it. Um, I mean, God gave me the family I was born into in the country and the time period and the, uh, the, 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 the raw materials and the resources and the intelligence and the, the, the drive. I mean, if, if I'd been born like 200 years before, um, I mean, I, I think I'd be, I'd be dead by now. I have like no discernible skill sets uh, beyond kind of what I, what I have now. Um, and so, um, you know, in, in terms of the, the way we approach the business, I mean, I think there's a humility to it. Um, so buying businesses for, for, um, a reasonable price is a humble activity. Right, you pay more. You have to be believe more things are true to make the math work out. Um, so, so that's an inherently humble approach to business. And then, not using debt's a humble approach to business. I mean, we get ridiculed in our industry all the time um, by people who think we're idiots. Uh, and by the way, we are idiots. So it's fair. Um, but um, um, but we don't think in this particular area that we're wrong. Uh, we think that not using debt uh, gives us the optionality to use those. Uh, resources to hire more people and to uh, be flexible in, in our approach and to change when when things change. And certainly 2020 was a great example of us being one of the few groups out there that was hiring and flourishing, uh, despite a big downturn in some of the businesses when all of our competitors were having to lay people off and, you know, make really tough choices and spend all their time dealing with banks who were, you know, getting ready to foreclose on their equity. We didn't have to deal with any of that. Um, we were able to stay focused. So, um, you know, certainly I think that, um, you know, the beginning of wisdom is a fear of God, right? I mean, that's what that's Proverbs kicks off with that. And I think that that is the root of all uh, of all wisdom is is understanding uh, how God created the universe and the, the, the sort of the grain that he created it with. And, um, you know, there's a, there's ultimately, um, you know, there's a certain sort of God math, I think, that that you can you can lean into that, you know, not everything works out on a spreadsheet the way you think it's going to. And, and often, you know, at least in our case, it works out better, uh, at least historically than we, we expected. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we feel just, you know, greatly lavished on by God. And, and look, there's hard times too. I don't, it's not all rosy. I mean, sure, sure. With, with almost a thousand employees now, there's always somebody who's wow. sick and dying. And, you wow. know, it's a tough, um, you know, it's a, it's a tough, it's a, it's a tough thing to get used to the uh, emotional, uh, toll the, 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 the emotion of constant, uh, news, <laughs> I would say good and bad. Um, and that's something that, again, taking a humble approach, either, you know, either we feel like we're in control and that, that, that we are the ones who are going to make this thing or not. And if we are, then every piece of bad news is something that grates against your soul and gives you anxiety. Um, or you say, Hey, look, God's in control and has a way better plan and works all things out for my good and his glory. And, uh, I may not even see how that good is, is in my lifetime, but uh, I, I have to, to lean on that and know that. You made a statement not too long ago. I believe you first tweeted out that at first gave me pause and I thought, I don't know if I'm with him on this, but as I heard you unpack it, I thought, okay, I see where he's coming from. And it grabbed my attention because as an apologist, you said people act rationally always. Now, of course, one of the things I regularly tell apologists is people don't really act just according to reason, but their appetites, their emotions, their desires. So what do you mean that people act rationally always? Well, so uh, again, this goes back to humility. I mean, I would I would say in my worst moments, I am uh, very condescending and judgmental of other people, mm -hmm. right? And I, I would say that my personality um, it, it, it it lends itself to easily going down that path. And one of the things I you know I have to do quite frequently is is you know correct my my perspective and try to understand okay what what is uh, where am I going astray? And when I start feeling that way, why am I feeling that way? And I think it gives you an easy excuse if you if your view is um, everyone's irrational and everyone's an idiot, right? Um, it gives you a, a, an ability to walk around and basically cast aspersions and condescend almost everyone around you. 
um, you know, oftentimes not looking at yourself in the same light, right? Like when, when I, you know, I, it's funny, uh, uh, I heard this from somebody once, it's like, you're always going the right speed, right? Uh, everyone else is either going, is either a maniac who's going way too fast or an idiot who's going way too slow, right? But you're always driving the right <laughs> speed. Um, and I think that that's a, that's a good analogy for how we view life, right? Um, you know, we often judge ourselves by our, our intentions and other people by their actions. And, um, you know, when, when you, when you take the reverse of that and say, okay, look, everyone's acting rationally. I mean, it actually makes sense from a logic perspective. No one is trying to harm themselves in the moment. So in the moment, you know, everyone is saying I'm choosing that, you know, to eat an entire Boston cream pie because, um, in the moment, I think that it, I, I'm choosing, I think that's a, the best thing to do that was going to deliver me the most pleasure. Um, I'm going to enjoy myself the most and whatever combination of my preferences and my perspective um, is, is, is making me choose um, to do that thing. Now, would somebody who's a third party say, hey, maybe eating an entire Boston cream pie is the right thing to do in the, in the moment? Uh, probably not, but I think that you have to then look at that person and the humility that it provides you to say, okay, that person thought that that was the best choice for them, mm. right? They thought in the moment that was the rationally, um, that, that, was, that was the correct logic. Um, so then the question is, why did they think that was the correct logic? What are they discounting that you're not discounting? Or what are you discounting that they're not discounting? Um, and, it, and it forces you, I mean, maybe that person, can, maybe that person has terminal cancer and they know that Boston cream pie is not going to be killing them. And so they're like, hey, look, like one of the advantages of having terminal cancer is I can eat all the Boston cream pies I want. And I know I'm not going to experience heart failure. That's not the thing mm -hmm. that's going to kill me. Um, so, you know, I, and I'm using that as an example that's, that seems sure. frivolous. But, you know, it, 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 you think about the bigger things in life and you think about how people make choices. And, you know, uh, the, the question is, what is the inputs and what is the logic that, that underlies our decisions? And I think that's where it, it gives you a humility to really study those and say, okay, where I disagree with people, where somebody's making a choice that I disagree with, I really want to understand them and have empathy for them. Why did they think in the moment that was the right choice to make? It's a very humble Christian way to approach people, I think, to understand. One, one of the things my dad always said to me, he said, it's more important to understand than to be understood. And it sounds like you're saying the same thing. When somebody acts, they act what they think is the most rational, whether it is or not. Let's understand where people are coming from first. That's a charitable way to approach people. I love it. Now, you wrote an article that jumped out to me when I, when I was doing a little research in Forbes. This was a number of years ago. Uh, and you, the title was, No One Cares About You, and That's Great. What do you mean by that? Yeah. Well, so I was an atheist when I wrote that article. <clears throat> um, and, oh, wow. um, yeah, so I think it's been, I think it's been probably eight or nine years. Um, I've been an atheist or I was, I, I became a believer. I was a very baby believer, uh, seven ish years ago. Okay. Um, so it's, you know, I'm still a fairly new mm. Christian. I mean, in, in the, in, especially in the grand scheme of things in the walk, um, so, uh, so yeah, when I wrote that I was an atheist, I, I certainly had been wrestling with this idea of, um, so I, you know, I was high anxiety, high control, mm. and I felt like all the eyes of the world were on me. Um, and I had had, I can't remember at the time what the failure was, but there had been some failure that, that I thought that everyone was going to stand up and take notice. Um, and that everyone was going to sort of like point and laugh and say, Hey, what, that guy's an idiot. You know, they would finally figure out who I really was. Right. And I remember, uh, you know, sort of being kept up weeks on end uh, at night. I couldn't sleep. And wow. I just, all I had was these, these, these images and dreams of, you know, people laughing at me and people talking mm. badly about me and, and then nothing happened and no one even noticed. And huh. I remember thinking to myself, like, well, that's an interesting feedback loop. Like, uh, here I thought I was really important and everyone thought about me and <laughs> turns out people don't think about me. <laughs> turns, turns out no one's really paying attention. Um, and you know, um, and, and it was, it was a revelation to me at the time, uh, that, uh, you know, and of course I took it to the extreme, right? I was feeling these internal feelings at the time of, of, uh, a sort of desolation and, and a lack of care and empathy, um, even towards my wife, right. Which I had said earlier, um, and so I think I extrapolated the fact that no one cared about my business failure. No one seemed to, it didn't seem to matter to then kind of fusing that with my internal feelings at the time about, um, you know, about how I was feeling. And so um, what I would say is that I very much would disagree with that statement now. Um, and it's interesting, you know, if I, 
if I could go back, I've actually rewritten a lot of the stuff that I wrote early on in my career on the permanent equity website um, to, you know, to reflect a sort of updated view of what I do think, you know, I can't do the same thing on Forbes. And, you know, one of sure. the brutally difficult things about writing on the internet is that it stays forever. So, um, you know, all the things that I, uh, that I wrote as an atheist uh, still, still are out there, which is, you know, it's good. It's humbling for me to remember that 10 years from now, I'll probably look back on the stuff I wrote now and be like, oh my gosh, you know, but um, there's no humility without humiliation, right? So hmm. that tries to give, that encourages me to give charity to people knowing that, I've written stuff myself. Even when I was a Christian, I was like, man, what was I thinking? Yeah. So do I have charity for people there in a way I hope people will have for me in 10 years when I update and adapt and I learn more. But unfortunately in our cancel culture, that is often not the case for people. Now, one of the ways I first learned about you, Brent, is my brother-in-law is a financial planner and he was sending me some tweets that you're sending out and he's like he's like hey Sean you should check this guy Brent be sure he's really successful in business but he's doing like apologetics publicly on Twitter and first off I was like this is just awesome that anybody outside of my normal lane is doing apologetics but then I started thinking I was like wow you have a public platform presumably work with people of different faiths or of no faith obviously you've calculated that this could potentially cost you in people's eyes being public about Christianity. And I presume you work with people of all sorts of different faiths. So why have you chosen at times to do apologetics, share your faith and evangelism on platforms like Twitter, podcasts, and others? Well, I mean, I, the way I would uh, analogize it is uh, I had cancer. Um, it was terminal cancer. Uh, it made me feel terrible. Um, I thought I was going to die from it. And um, I, I, the, the cure found me. And, um, and, and now uh, feeling so different and feeling the way I do now and, and having just the, the explosion of bright colors and tastes and smells that a world filled with enchantment gives you um, and, and, and a life that following Jesus leads to, um, it's just the most beautiful, wonderful thing. It's like a complete revelation in my, in my life and who I am. And I can feel it down into my, into my bones. How can I not share that? Right? Like, like mm. how, why in the world would I prioritize my reputation? I mean, I'm, I'm a vapor. No one's going to know my name in a hundred years. Who cares? Um, why would I prioritize, you know, m money or, uh, you know, sort of temporary, um, reputation or to, to not tell people about this wonderful thing. I mean, I'm not doing it because I think that I get like, you know, brownie points in heaven or whatever for, for converting people or, you know, whatever the thing is. Like, I, I, I don't think that at all. Like I, it's, it's all a gift. Um, I, I, uh, I just want to be, uh, kind and generous. Like I, I think about myself as an atheist, how lost I was all the time and how I would have just how, how I was so grateful to find people who reached out to me and, and, and loved me and, and, and you know, pointed me to, to Jesus. And so anyway, I, I mean, I, I, it's really just, um, I, I really don't feel like I have a choice in, in all the best ways. I mean, I want to, I want to make sure to, to, um, you know, correct people and not correct people sounds like the wrong word. I want to encourage people to, to study who Jesus is and, and to, to point to him in such a way that, um, is winsome and thoughtful and like one of the things that intrigued me about your story is that uh some time ago you decided to go do theological training obviously wanting to learn about your faith serve god more but then in a, i think it was about your second year you pulled out of it for interesting reasons tell us about that yeah i mean so i i when i was public about my faith and and uh, you know sort of i'm one of the few people in in the in the finance world especially in private equity who who's sort of an out christian um you know i would say um i, I started getting a lot of inbound uh, people asking me lots of questions and a lot of difficult questions and i felt like i um had a duty to having uh you know good answers i didn't want to certainly lead mm -hmm. people astray and so um, had an opportunity through uh, my local church to uh, participate in a, in a cohort uh, at a seminary. Um, so uh, did uh, a couple of years of study at, at, at Covenant Theological Seminary out of St. Louis. And um, it was wonderful. I mean, unbelievable uh, training. You know, I, I went to uh, law and MBA out of undergrad and 
um, I would say uh, the, the, the difficulty of the school um, was on par with, with some of the best law school classes I took uh, wow. in, terms of, in terms of rigor. Um, what I found that, uh, so then I did drop out, so I, I quit the program. Um, and what I found was I was, uh, I was using it, um, unfortunately, as a bolster to my pride. Um, I, I, the more that I uh, grew in knowledge, um, the, the more distant I felt from God. Wow. And, uh, you know, I have a real tendency to want to learn about God more than to want to be in God's presence and have a mm. relationship with God. And um, it, look, it, it ultimately comes back down to pride, right? Am I, it, you know, am I gaining, am I gaining in knowledge? Am I gaining in, in stature? Am I gaining in the praise of people? And um, was I, you know, that's just the wrong game. I mean, that's winning at a terrible game. And I think that, you know, so much of religion, and especially in Christianity, I would say in the United States, is, uh, is a game of gain. Hmm. And that's just not, that has nothing to do with God. That has nothing to do with the relationship with, with the creator. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I, I realized that it was a pride issue. I realized that I, um, um, that, that it was becoming a, a duty and it was not, it was becoming, um, uh, more about me than it was about God. And it just wasn't healthy. So, you know, thankfully yeah. from that wisdom, uh, I was able to, to lay it aside. I think that's a great choice. Now, if you ask most people, where would somebody more likely fall into the trap of pride, theological training or leading a business that is designed towards making money and equity? I think 90% of people would say, oh my goodness, in the world of wealth, because the Bible talks not about concern with theological training, but with money, it's all over the place. So what are just some things you do to, to try to protect your own heart from the seduction of wealth? Yeah, well, well let's talk about wealth here in a second, but I, I will challenge you on that, on that topic. Um, okay. Uh, so, so who was Jesus harshest to? The Pharisees. Right? True. And who were the Pharisees? They were the religious elite. They were the people that knew it all. They did it all. They followed their religion exactly. They took it super seriously. They were the most religious of the religious people, right? Um, and so, you know, it, it is counterintuitive, I think, to the lens that we look through to say that that uh, theological training would be a dangerous thing to to engage in from a pride issue perspective. But I would say is biblically, um, it is actually very dangerous. Uh, it's very mm. straightforward. Um, and, and, you know, Jesus was the most difficult on the harshest to uh, the, the, the religious elites. And I could feel my heart being pulled towards uh being a pharisee right being somebody wow. who had all the answers that that i could you know i could out argue somebody who who hmm. uh knew less than me and i would use uh that sort of that knowledge as a bludgeon uh against them and um and, and look i i you know when you start reading in your bible and you start reading about the pharisees and the interactions that jesus had with pharisees I could just see myself uh, be, being that, and I could see Jesus being being rather <laughs> rather harsh with me uh, in my uh, condescension. So, um, now m money, yes, money is talked about far more than sex in the Bible. Money is talked about uh, as as being, um, you know, one of the most dangerous things, uh, you know, for for our souls. Now, now the question is why? Because um, Jesus loves the rich person. Jesus calls the rich person. Jesus calls the the poor person. J Jesus doesn't care about it, right? Um, you know, he, I think Jesus's view on it would be um, that that money is a is a gift and a tool um, to be able to grow the garden, you know, build the kingdom, right? Um, and and a good gift from God. Um, and and really, I you know, I think the Bible's pretty clear. It's not a sin to be rich. It's a sin to want to get rich. Um, and look, this is something that, that mm. I, I fight a lot. And the, and the issue is that, that when you have more uh, material resources, uh, you can pretend not to need God. And I, and I would say, you know, we, we tend to, you know, when you ask most people in the United States, you know, who, who are the rich people, right? They're going to, you know, talk about Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or Warren Buffett sure. or somebody like that. Um, if you look at historical standards, like basically almost everyone, and, and by the way, when I say this, I'm, I'm saying this from a, a decently educated position on this topic like I, I was a poverty studies minor in college my okay. wife and I are very active in the uh, in the um, uh, poverty relief uh, sort of human deprivation area that's an area that we feel really called to um, uh, to help serve in that area and, and what I would say though is that even even in the United States some of the, 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 the on the on the least of those like the, the poorest there's there's definitely a, a social poverty but the material possessions they have even allow you know some of the poorest people to to ignore God. 
certainly as you start working your way up to where you can go anywhere, travel anywhere, buy almost anything, um, the temptation to, to stray from God is just, just becomes, um, you know, magnetic. Hmm. And I've certainly experienced this in my own life. And, um, you know, the world gets very, very small, the, the wealthier you get. <clears throat> and when I say very small, hmm. it becomes small because you get so protective, you hold tight to what you have. Um, it becomes a source of your uh, salvation, it becomes a source of your reputation, it becomes a source of your uh, control that you can exert onto the world. Um, and when you can have really anything you want, whenever you want it, um, wow. it is it is like, you know, it, it, you know, I don't know if you ever played video games growing up, like it was like having the cheat code, right? And, it, and, and you know, when you have the cheat code is the coolest thing, right? Because you can have all the things you want, you can upgrade your vehicle or have all the latest whatever thing in the game, right? But did you ever notice something? If you ever use a cheat code, like you, you basically quit playing the game within the day, um, because true. it the game loses its taste. Like there's no there's no um, um, there's no difficulty. There's no mm. challenge to it anymore. And and what I would say is, if you look at the world, the the least happy people I know are the wealthiest. Um, in fact, if you ask wow. me what is the one thing um, that would predict somebody's misery, it would be large amounts of wealth. Um, Wow. And so um, the irony is we're all we're all trying to strive for that. We all want more. If you ask me, you know, it's you know, I, I pray often that God blesses us and, and leads us to flourishing. Um, mm. And, you know, I, I think um, it is certainly a gift and there's incredible things you can do with it. And um, but but I also think that there's a there's a real danger and a temptation. And I think it's, um, you know. And James, James would say, you know, if, if you are rich, uh, rub your nose and how poor you really are, right? And if you're poor, realize that the riches you have in God. So I think there's a, hmm. there's a nice uh, negative feedback loop uh, that occurs to bring the, the rich down and the, and the poor up. And, and it's about equalizing. I mean, we're all made in the image of God. Um, you know, the, the only difference between rich people and poor people is rich people have more money. That's it. <laughs> I, I love that pushback on theological training you started with because the Bible has a ton to say about the importance of correct doctrine. You know, Paul writes, don't be childish in your thinking. And, and Titus talks about the importance of teaching and sound doctrine. So there's a right place for theology, but in the Pharisees, it can go wrong. Well, the same is true with wealth. There's a right place for wealth. It's the love of money, so to speak, that becomes deduction, not the making of money. And maybe theological training can be particularly dangerous because we see it with money, we talk about it, but we don't with theology in the same way. So in that sense, it can even be more dangerous if it's not in our radar. So I think that's a great pushback. I, I'm curious how if Christian principles benefit you in business or not. And what I mean by this, and, and what I do is obviously different, so I apologize even making a comparison here, but sometimes I think about, like my YouTube channel, for example, I often think about how do I love my audience, which is a Christian idea. So this isn't about me, this is about saying, how do I interview certain people, ask certain questions that'll benefit and challenge and equip my audience. And I just found when I approach it that way, it works. Now, there might be other ways I could be more provocative or I could do certain things to get better views if that was my metric of success. But I found certain Christian ideas actually work when it comes to business. How do you see it in terms of what you do? Yeah, well, I would say, uh, yeah, of course it works because that's there's a truth to the universe. And, and, and I believe that, that, that in the Bible, God reveals himself and who he is and how he made this world. So um, it, it makes complete sense. In fact, one of the strongest, you know, bolstering of my faith occurred whenever I started realizing that like every business book that I read was just based on biblical principles. Huh. I mean, you know, like everything's in the Bible. I mean, if you read, you know, <laughs> if you read Ecclesiastes, it's going to give you incredible perspective. You know, if you, if you read the Psalms and, you know, how, how to, how to think about God, how to think about your relationship with others and how to your relationship with God. Um, if you think about, you know, you think about Job, if, I mean, it, all these stories, right. That, that, that are in the Bible, are, are telling us about a, a truth to the reality. There's a grain to the universe. And so, of course, you're going to, um, you know, if we were going to sort of secularize the, the principles, you know, you, by you saying you want to love your audience, it makes complete sense that you would, that you would 
you're thinking about them, you're showing empathy towards them, you're delivering to them a product that is helpful to them. You know, of course, that makes complete sense. You know, in a secularized mm-hmm. world, you would say, you know, what's the job to be done, right? What's the what's the thing that you're trying to achieve? How are you, you know, adding value, quote unquote, to your audience? Um, you know, in, in reality, though, what you're doing is you're trying to love them, you're trying to care for them, you're trying to, you know, shepherd them. Um, which is, you know, more of what God would call it. Um, but yeah, it makes complete sense. And I mean, hmm. this is, a, again, like, I think there's a lot of people out there, there's a whole movement that are non-believers, um, but the, who find a lot of value in biblical principles as being sort of a source of ancient wisdom. And there's a lot of people who think that, you know, Jesus isn't the son of God and isn't, you know, God incarnate and and, and come to earth, who just think he was an incredibly great teacher and has great principles, right? Um, obviously, the problem with that is that, that Jesus said he was God <laughs> and, and said some right. really hard things. And so you can't just think he's this incredible, wonderful teacher and not take him seriously at what he said. Um, mm. But... Uh, but yeah, it doesn't it doesn't surprise me at all, Sean. And I would say that that you know we've we've seen the more that um, the more that we live out our faith in the business, and the more that we um, really a- adhere to what we think of as as being um, the way that God made the universe and, and put the grain in the world, the the better things turn out in business on average. At the same time, mm-hmm. look, the world's not predictable. Like this is the this is a Proverbs <laughs> view of the right. world versus a Job view of the world, right? Huh. Like you read that that's what's so beautiful about how the the, the Bible. I mean. You can't ever just read one Bible verse, right? I mean, in fact, most of the coffee mug, you know, coffee cup Bible verses are taken way out of context. Um, you've got to always read around it, and you've got to read the Bible in concert with with how they all interlock together, right? If you read Proverbs, you say, okay, look, if you do these principles, good things happen. Well, then what do you do with somebody like Job, where he did everything right, and God called him, you know, uh, incredibly faithful, and he had everything, he had his family die, and all his material possessions taken away. What do you do with that? Well, if you're Job's friends, you say, well, clearly, Job, you've got sin in your heart. You've, you've, you've got things that are going on that are, that are, that are unrepentant sin. Like, you need, to, you need to cleanse your heart. You need to be, you know, you'd be a better Christian. Um, that's not the way the world works, though. Um, and so if you look at Job, you can say you can do everything right and get everything wrong, right? Um, so, you know, I think that's where there's, there's a lot of nuances. On average, I think God designs the universe to work a certain way, and it's a beautiful thing. And the more that we adhere to that, I think the, the better things are going to go in general. You've mentioned Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, uh, the Gospels, Job. Do you have a favorite book of the Bible, just given your wiring and your job and your experience? Uh, if so, what would it be and why? Or even maybe a yeah. story or person in the Bible. It doesn't necessarily have to be a particular book. Yeah, I mean, um, I, 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 I love James. I think James uh, mm. is, is, there's incredible wisdom and, and practicality to James. I think James is kind of like the, the no BS uh, book of the Bible, right? Like, yes, you show me your faith without works. I show you my, my, my faith by my works. Right. Mm. Um, uh, and, 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 and it's important for us to realize that, you know, what fruit really looks like and, and to not confuse ourselves as to if, if we really are growing in fruit or not, which is the, which is the test of faith, right? Like, are, are we moving along uh, the spectrum, uh, not by our own effort, not by our works, not to earn God's salvation or trust or anything like that, or God's love. But, but uh, I think that's an important piece. I, I would say though, Ecclesiastes really is like, it's the smelling mm-hmm. salts of life. Um you know, I think especially for somebody who's in a privileged position that I am um, to, to read about somebody who is way more privileged, who did all the things, tasted all the all the things in life and, and came away saying vanity of vanities. It's all vanity. Right. Um, you know, that, that it's all a vapor. It's all it's all going to go up. And, and the more the, the, you know, the longer I live and, and the more I uh, see my straying in my own life and my temptation to to to, to take things that aren't mine and to, to consume them uh and and that it never satisfies uh it may taste sweet in the moment uh it 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 may be a a temporary relief but but ultimately it leads to misery it's you know the more i go back and read ecclesiastes the more it just it just sinks to me um it is just the most densely packed wisdom in the world and uh anytime i feel myself straying um going back and and reading ecclesiastes or i in fact i mean listening to ecclesiastes is is something that i think is even even more powerful and um there's a book uh, i think the best meditation on ecclesiastes is a book by david gibson he's a he's a scottish pastor uh called living life backward 
Okay. And um, I've recommended it on Twitter a couple times. I, I, I think it, you know, I probably, I probably, I think I've given it 90 times. I think I've given the book away 90 times. Oh my um, goodness. Uh, my last check on, on Amazon. And uh, I have uh, probably reread it now. I'm probably pushing seven or eight times rereading it. It is just, wow. it's an unbelievable uh, meditation on Ecclesiastes. And he's an incredibly talented guy, but I uh, uh, would encourage, you know, you, your audience to uh, pick it up and read it and reread it and sort of savor it. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. So final question for you, if some people stayed with us to the end and there's some people who are not Christians and who are intrigued and opening to considering kind of this journey that you've described, what, what steps would you encourage somebody to take who's open to it, wants to know the truth, not yet convinced, and maybe where you were at some point in the past? What encouragement would you give to those seeking yeah, well, first of all, I would say is just it, it's a huge thing. It's it, it, to be intellectually honest is one of the most difficult things in our society right now. Um, everyone wants to play gotcha. Everyone wants to be mm. to be right and to, to to trumpet how right they are. And I think that having a humility and an intellectual honesty is just to encourage you to to really hold that tight. Like like I, I believe that. Um, you know, it says in the Bible, if you knock, the door will be answered, right? Like truth will be revealed to you. I think that you need to be, uh, hold your beliefs loosely and, and really just go and study who Jesus is. Um, I, I think there's no substitute for reading the word of God. Um, I know that sounds, you know, contrite and, and obvious, but, um, I would pick up a, a study Bible, um, that has some commentary in it that, that, that you can kind of follow along with it. And I would encourage you just to read and, and just, actually go study what Jesus said. Um, I think mm. most people would be shocked if they actually went and studied Jesus. Like, um, mm. And then, of course, branch out. I mean, I think, you know, obviously Tim Keller has been an incredible uh, light and gift in this world. He's written, gosh, I don't know, a dozen more books, probably 15, 16 books at this point. Pretty much every Tim Keller book is going to be a, a thoughtful <laughs> rumination on the topic, way more thoughtful than anything that I'm going to say. Um, but I would, but I would, you know, I, Tim Keller was obviously a, a, a gateway for me. G.K. Chesterton, I think, is just unbelievable. Oh, wow. If you're intellectual, G.K. Chesterton is fantastic. And then, of course, C.S. Lewis is just, mm. he's the, he's, I, I feel like, you know, he's in the, almost the Blaise Pascal camp of like OG, you know, uh, Christian uh, in that way. Um, you know, if you really want to nerd out, going back to some of the Desert Fathers, uh, Augustine, um, okay. I think is a really great way. Um, the, some of the stuff is so shocking to your senses because it's so such a different view of the world, um, you know, that, that and just I a mean, completely different uh, time and place and worldview and, and, and all the assumptions that, that I think I found it encouraging to me, uh, the consistency of the, the, the theology um, and, re and really um, how united we are uh, as brothers and sisters in Christ across all ages and, and, and geographies and skin colors and all the, the differences, cultures. So, um, yeah. I love that you started by suggesting people go to the scriptures. A blog I wrote a few years ago that every year just keeps getting hits is the titles like the top five books to give to a non-believer. And my first one is of course i mentioned c.s lewis mentioned more than a carpenter but i mentioned the gospel of john first if you really are a seeker i would suggest going to the word of god and you might not believe it's the word of god but just ask yourself who is this person jesus uh what did he say about his teachings what did he say about the world what uh why has he had such an impact on world history just go to the gospels with an open heart and it's amazing what often happen so love that suggestion sounds like you want to jump in and say something well i i just want to say one more thing is is <clears throat> somebody challenged me uh when i was not a believer yet and and they said have you ever sat quietly and asked god to truly reveal himself to you like prayed to god as if he's real um hmm. and look like you know i'm sure my, my my first prayer was like a meet the parents style like i had no idea what i was <laughs> doing like it probably sounded ridiculous and i felt stupid doing it but I, there was a moment where I, I can remember they said that to me and, and they said, have you ever done that? And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. And they said, no, for real. Like, have you actually done that? No, OK, I haven't. And it was like three days later and I found myself alone, nothing to do. I was bored. Um, and I just remember being like, oh, OK, I guess I'll just give it a, I'll give it a roll. Um, and I remember just, you know, it was probably five, seven minutes just sitting there and just saying, look, I just want to know the truth. Like if if you're there, please, please, please just you know, whisper to me, tell me something like, I don't know, move through me, change my heart, wow. like whatever. And I think that that's such a powerful thing because we are so often not actually seeking God. 
Um, you know, I, I remember reading the Bible multiple times as an atheist and just my, my heart was so hardened and I would look at, at what I was reading and I would be like, this is stupid. Like every, every line was stupid. And look, the good news is not the good news until you realize what a, what a depraved sinner you are. Um, and, and at the time, like I couldn't even imagine looking at myself in that light. Um, I, I, I had to build myself up. I had, I was a good person, right? How dare you say I was a sinner? How dare you? Right. I, I was easily offended. Um, and I think that's where, you know, asking God to truly reveal to you who you really are, that you are both an unbelievably depraved sinner and you are a wonderfully loved, unbelievably cared for and, child of God. And that God just wants a relationship with you. Like that's the most beautiful thing. Yeah, but it, it, you've got to come into it with an intellectual honesty and a humble heart. Um, and I think that's where God will meet you. God flows to the humble, right? And God, the low points get God, uh, not the high points. God, you know, Jesus came to save sinners, not the righteous. Brent, can help, how can viewers best follow you in your thinking? Well, I would normally say Twitter, but I'm actually taking a, a, a Twitter break right now. Um, I, uh, I, I went off right after Christmas, and I think I'll be back around Easter. Um, okay. I, I still am I'm intermittently checking my DMs, and my DMs are open. So I would say is find me on Twitter, DM me. I'll, I'll try to make sure that I may not be super responsive. Um, my email is pretty easy to get a hold of. Um, you feel free to email me. Uh, you can come through the Permanent Equity website if you want. Like I try to be you know fairly available um, and uh, hmm. try to be helpful. So. Really appreciate you coming on. Thanks so much for your time. And if you ever decide you're in a spot where you want to go back to theological and apologetic training, we would love to have you at <laughs> Biola. Uh, we have a full distance program, Problem of Evil, Reliability of the Gospels, Resurrection. Uh, so that is wide open if you decide to go that direction. Uh, hang on just a minute afterwards if we end so I can thank you. But again, really appreciate your time. Such wonderful stuff. Thanks for coming on.